West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com The most prominent election lawyer in the country right now is Mark Elias. He is the Democratic powerhouse lawyer who headed the team that won more than 60 lawsuits against Republicans and the Trump campaign over the 2020 election. Elias has been fighting new voting restrictions put in place by Republican legislatures ever since. Well, today, Mark Elias wrote an op-ed warning about the method in the Republicans' madness here and warning that it may be leading us toward a real crisis. He said, quote, immediately following the insurrection on January 6th, Republican state legislatures began laying the groundwork for 2022 and 2024. They enacted new voter suppression laws optimized to disenfranchise black, brown and young voters. They created false narratives of election regularities and rallied their supporters around the big lie. The goal of these new provisions is to manufacture fraud where none exists. Since one of the big problems in all of the sort of bogus Republican Trumpy election audits and election results investigations is that they haven't been able to actually find any significant fraud anywhere. What Elias is saying is the strategy here is to manufacture it, to make a bunch of new tricky to understand laws that do make it harder to vote. And then when people make mistakes by voting how they have always voted, call that fraud and use that as a pretext to overturn any election results that you don't like. The way Mark Elias puts it today, he says, quote, we are one, maybe two elections away from a constitutional crisis. Joining us now is Mark Elias, election attorney, founder of the group Democracy Docket. Mr. Elias, it's nice of you to be with us tonight. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Am I right that you are trying to help us knit together these various things that we have been reporting on sort of in isolation to see them as part of a single strategy, to see them as things that work together to try to subvert future election results? Yeah, that's exactly right, Rachel, is too many people are looking at the fight for voter uh, for voting rights and against voter suppression as somehow separate and distinct from election subversion. They really go hand in glove. You know, the fact is Republicans didn't find much fraud, really any fraud, because there wasn't much of any fraud. So what they're trying to do now is to make the voting rules harder for people to vote particularly harder for young voters uh, and minority voters to vote, and essentially manufacturing um, irregularities where they don't exist so that they can then use those made up irregularities in 2022 or 2024 to argue that elections shouldn't be certified uh, and therefore uh, uh, subverted. If that is the goal, to, 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 to approach these problems in a way where you are both making it harder to vote, giving, uh, making it harder to vote in such a way that gives you uh, evidentiary pretext for calling the whole operation of the election fraudulent so that you can subvert the result of the election. If these things are all knitted together, um, 
Where's the place where you can short circuit that? Where's the place that you can stop that? So look, the first thing we need is for Congress to pass the various voting rights bills that are pending before them, both the Freedom to Vote Act in the Senate, the voting, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and those will go a long way. Now, there are other things that can be done to specifically target the certification process, which I, you know, which I write about. I think that it's long time past having secretaries of state and governors signatures required in order to certify election results. We ought to be moving to more nonpartisan uh, ways of certifying election results so that a single Trump acolyte who is a secretary of state can't stop someone from getting a certificate of election simply by refusing to sign a piece of paper. If the Democrats in Washington aren't able to get it together to do this, if they leave the filibuster rules as they are, if people like Senator Manchin, Senator Sinema continue to not be interested in helping a Democratic majority, slim as it is, pass things either by reconciliation or changing the Senate rules, um, are there things that can be done at the state level, short of just litigating every one of these cases, uh, that could, in some systematic way, provide the kind of protections that you're talking about? Or is this something for which there's only, only a federal remedy? So a federal remedy is best. But if Congress doesn't act in this area, then it's incumbent on all of us to take the necessary action. So that means in blue states, by the way, improving the voting laws substantially from where they are in many uh, in many states where Democrats have the ability to make voting easier. It includes recruiting and training and making sure that good uh, people are filling the slots of local election officials. You know, there's been a lot of reporting recently about how good election officials are being driven out of their positions because Trump crazies are driving them out of their positions. Of course, the courts have to be a piece of this. You know, I started my career as a recount lawyer, and I know the power of the, the judiciary to ensure that the will of the voters is abided by in election returns. And finally, people like you, the media and activists speaking out and putting a spotlight on what's going on, a spotlight on the fact that Republicans are planning a constitutional crisis by targeting election uh, uh, certification processes. By putting spotlight on it, we might be able to head some of it off. It is Thursday. The 14th of October of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Well, it looks like subpoena day. Do they answer it or do they not? I think that's uh, already, uh, we the, the news has already been out there. Um, I've been in a bit of a bubble, as you must be aware, so that I can get this show together. I have to shut it off at some point. But uh, I, I heard a little bit of rumbling that uh, Bannon's ignoring it. So uh, will they send the SWAT team for him? I wish they would. They oughta. So, you know, you don't punch the Nazis. This is what's happened. This is what happens. It is. <laughs> it's been happening a lot. Boy. Boy. So, uh, it looks like uh, Rosen had been speaking with the select committee for a considerable time. Oh, my gosh. Okay. All right. And uh, uh, it looks like the chickens are coming home to roost. Uh, will we be able to save ourselves? I don't know. I really don't. I used to think that uh, nothing could vanquish us. I used to. I had a little idea that it would be from within. Well, uh, let's put it this way. I suspected it would be, and it would be from the the obvious actors, you know, the ones who always acted out instead of having a true sentiment about what it meant to be an American. Take on the trappings. Exaggerate certain parts of it. Uh-huh. Well, 
That which I refuse to suspect has now come to fruition. And here we are. You know, I, you, you think that when you have your, your end of life years, and it, you know, for me it might be a couple of decades. God, I hope so. More. <laughs> but still, you think, oh man, I'll finally be able to rest. No, there ain't no rest. It gets worse. My poor mother, she is shocked. She is truly shocked. She remembers being a girl wondering, well, you know, we're all we're all God's children. She was cute. And uh, the bigots around her said, no, we're not. And she refused to believe that. She refused to believe the hate that surrounded her. Now, granted, you know, you get hit by it. There are certain things that you have to relearn. And but but her initial sentiment was we're all God's children. What is the problem? So she did some marching and she did some petitioning and she worked to make America better. And now she was complaining that it's worse than when she was a little girl. That's sad. I kind of feel like it too. Now, I remember crosses burned on our front lawn because I wasn't that young. <laughs> Jeez. I knew exactly what it meant. Was I traumatized? No, I, I, just, I thought it was weird that somebody would go to that effort to do that. In today's modern go go society in Southern California, well, it was San Gabriel Valley. I mean, look. Where we lived in Roland Heights, uh, to the uh, to the east of us, is that would, would that be correct? Yes, or would it be more to the south? Anyway, to the right of us, how do we how do we uh, how do we uh, orientate ourselves? How about this? If you're looking out at the beach, you're looking west. To the left of us, then, was the John Birch Society headquarters in Diamond Bar. And then to the right of us was the uh, White Citizens Council in one office and on the same floor the American Nazi Party. So I don't know. <laughs> Talk about liberal California. Jeez. Sure, we're a lot of races there. Anyway, uh, I remember the hate and I thought you know, we've made some great strides. Heck, heck, I remember when uh, uh, the, our attitude about homosexuality, the whole gay scene, lesbians and all of that, it seemed we were on a good trajectory to, well, have due process and equal protection for all. But I don't know. It's like... <laughs> The people on the right go, God, you know, we just got used to not having black people to kick around. And now you're going to take away gay people? Come on, we need somebody to kick. Well, how about changing your attitude, you hateful mo ghoul? <laughs> what a hateful lot they are. And they are. And they gloat in it. They want to make you know that they got away with something. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, that reminds me that uh, weird fellow who was responsible for continuously getting me suspended on Facebook for bullying and harassing after he pretty much was bullying and harassing. And any benign comment, anything, then Facebook would concur with this fellow that I was the bully and I was the one harassing until I got pushed too far. So I decided, I know maybe I should have done it a long time ago. I don't know why I didn't. Oh, I know why. Because I hate doing this stuff. But okay. So I screenshot a, a gloating 
uh, direct message that he sent me. You know, it's sort of like a friend request to get on uh, DM, you know, so we'll be friends on, on Facebook and then you can DM each other. And I guess it was in Messenger. I, I don't know. I usually ignore these requests. How about, you know, when you get requests from people to get on DMs like that, but you're already friends with them and you can already do that, what does that mean? I guess I need to get a hold of the people and say, hey, you might want to check to see if your uh, account is hacked because you just said that you wanted to be my friend. I thought we already were. Anyway, so this guy sends these DMs and I only just noticed it. uh, I don't know. A a while ago. Not not recently, but certainly not in the beginning. And every time I was suspended, this guy would send a DM and just gloat. And use like homophobic slurs and racial slurs and just any number of weird things that these hateful sadists, you know, use to to make themselves feel like they are, you know, the Dom. First of all, I'm not wearing a dog collar. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting here quietly. Because I've seen this guy, at least what he purports to be, and he ain't that big of a guy. So you don't want to awaken the sleeping giant. No, you don't. So anyway, uh, I screenshot the last, I don't know, uh, dig. And I put it on Twitter and a couple other places, and I tagged Facebook. And then I noticed that that particular uh, uh, comment or message on DM had been deleted. And then I don't know why, but I thought maybe I should check a little bit further. And it looks, I don't know what this means. Actually, I have a suspicion. But uh, this fellow has now deleted his profile. Of course, he's got a burner profile he's going to activate. Because I'm pretty sure that he's had others before, too. And he'll slightly change his name and thumb his nose at the algorithm. And they'll get away with it over and over and over. They'll do anything they can to silence us. And I say, no, (laughs) I will not be silenced. (laughs) You can't frighten me. Oh, I know. Now I'm asking for it. See, that's the other thing that Facebook will do. They'll threaten physical violence. And, you know, look, I, <laughs> as if I've never been threatened with physical violence before or had it attempted upon my personal being. Okay. Let's just say that, you know, I, I, I'm not without some uh, uh, talents. In those arenas, so to speak. So, anyway, I don't have to go out there and threaten people with physical violence because I got to tell you, I really don't want to do it because when it happens, I I don't like hurting people. I really don't. And I also don't like being hurt. That's what they never tell you. you if, if you punch somebody, it hurts your hand, especially when you hit it on bone, really hard bone like their head. That's why they wear gloves. Not to protect the head, it's to protect your hands. Jeez. That's why I like to grapple, you know. But I'm not grappling anymore. I'm an old man. What am I talking about? I'm not going to duke it out with anybody anymore. I don't need to. I still have a certain amount of body mass, shall we say. Not too much different from when I played football, but just... Maybe distributed slightly differently. Slightly. So, (laughs) enough of me. What am I doing? (laughs) Anyway, I don't need to uh, be frightened by these people necessarily. But there is a reason why they make a, a big deal about their Second Amendment rights to intimidate you. And uh, make you do what you don't want to do, but you have to do it because guess what? They all have guns. Little do they know that a lot of us do too, but I just don't like, you know, I, God, now I got to go and 
Oh, God, I hate that. Nope, not going to do it. They're there. Not that I got them. You know, you inherit them over time. Jeez. Okay, I thought I'd go through life without ever having to carry an arm, but you never know when the Nazis are around. Maybe uh, you got to give up your uh, your childhood promises about how you will act in the world. One promise that I did make when I was a child is the Nazis will never take over here, ever. All right. So I need some help. Can't do it by myself. I've gotten old enough that I know that for sure. So why don't we ha- uh, start, I don't know, maybe we could start a, a group and we could call ourselves anti-fascists. Yeah, Antifa for short. Why wouldn't it be Antifa? I don't know. All right. Enough of this gallows humor, is it? <laughs> Let's get into the curated part of this show, because we do have a curated part of this show. Oh, I should mention very briefly, uh, we do have a special guest in the background, uh, Ginger, the little Yorkshire poodle. She was having a little bad dream, and she's whimpering in the background. I feel so sorry for her. She's not a young girl anymore. She's actually quite elderly. And... Um, so I I don't know. She's kind of fallen apart and I feel sorry for her. But if you hear any whimpering in the background, it's because she was whimpering in the background, having a little little bad dream. She misses my mom. We visited. Oh, before we go on, we did visit with my mother yesterday. That's her in the background, too. She has a little congestive heart issues. So, oh, poor girl. But we did. We visited with my mother yesterday, and my mom is making good progress. The uh, physical therapist uh, uh, nurse there uh, showed me. Now, this is, you know, while I'm talking to my mom through a window because she's still in the, quote, COVID ward. But uh, mom has to strengthen up her throat muscles and whatnot. She had aspirated at some point, some food, and that's one of the reasons she caught or got pneumonia because of this particle in her lungs. Ick. So we're uh, strengthening up her swallowing muscles and other things like that and do better habits about sitting up instead of laying down when you eat. Okay. Something to remember as we get older and uh, some other things. But mom is doing quite well. She's got a little bit to go. We're still keeping our fingers crossed for the 21st. And uh, so, yeah. So I did take the dogs there. And Gunner, of course, was able. And mom was able to get uh, closer to the window as well and sit in the chair. Whereas before she was sort of propped up in a bed and couldn't really quite see. And they couldn't quite see her. But uh, uh, Gunner was real happy to see her. And and uh, Ginger, of course, has now gone deaf in the last month or more. And I can tell that her eyesight isn't so uh, perfect as well. But uh, she her scent is there. And uh, so it was good. It was lifted mom's spirits and the dogs liked it. And so... That's progress on mom as she recovers from COVID. Oh, the uh, Josephine County commissioners are going to sue. This was in the paper yesterday. They're going to sue all businesses who have a uh, vaccine mandate, hospitals, everybody. And that's funny because I, I, I'm trying to maybe pull the trigger and uh, sue some of the county commissioners in Josephine. There's only three, so I guess I'll do the the anti-vaxxer ones. And since I live in Jackson County as well, but it was Josephine County where my mother and I contracted this dreaded pandemic or disease that is this pandemic. Uh, Apparently, uh, by the active participation of the Josephine County commissioners. I'm not looking necessarily for a monetary award. No, I'll call it an entitlement. How do you like them apples? Okay. (laughs) Really? No. It'll be a reward. We're getting these scaff laws, uh, you know, out of public office and never to be able to run again. 
All right. We'll figure out how that works. Anyway, as we started off at the top, that was Mark Elias uh, explaining the GOP strategy to manufacture voter fraud where they have not found any with the explicit purpose of changing voting laws so they can destroy democracy. Yeah, so, sort of like the enabling acts. And they got like a running night of the long knives, too. And a crystal knocked thrown here and there every now and then. How do you like them redundancy apples? On the rest of the menu as we start off in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, FDI, FDA guidelines spell out lower sodium goals for the food industry, and that's probably a good thing. Now, we shouldn't be afraid of salt, but I got to tell you, big food uses a lot. That's why I don't like to use that prepackaged stuff or packaged stuff generally. There's a lot of salt there, and it's hard to determine how much on this end. And on this end, uh, we start adding it again. It not, It is not very wise, shall we say. And then I will also say the dish suffers. That's why I like to make things from scratch, and I don't have to worry about all the packaged stuff with all of the sodium. Well, a district judge ruled that Maine can bar religious exemptions to its health care work at COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Well, I might have to I might have to shorten that. And the same people who have no problem with offshore oil rigs darkening the horizon will complain Biden's offshore wind farms are an unrelenting eyesore. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where the U.N. has begun vaccinating people in the eastern Congo against Ebola. And a Holocaust forum in Sweden is looking at social media's role in the current steep rise in anti-Semitism. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. Thank you, Kelly, for taking care of the chat room. And also, uh, thank you and Ricky for taking care of Netroots Nation once again. Netroots Nation 21. So stay tuned for uh, content, interviews, and whatnot in the weeks ahead. Uh, For that Roost Nation 21. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Ricky. If you would look across from the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, there is a link to our Patreon page. And yes, we need money. (laughs) If you could could afford an espresso-type coffee drink and send those funds to us once a month, uh, that really helps us pay our bills. And I need say no more, especially since I been making these uh, morning rants uh, quite ranting uh, (laughs) and full of rants. So anyway, uh, yes, all kidding aside, uh, we do need help paying our bills. And so that's why we make these entreaties to you. And once again, if you could afford that espresso type coffee drink and just, uh, you know, buy that for us once a month by sending the funds to us, uh, we stretch those dollars beyond compare pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue this resistance against the hostile, and it looks like a violent takeover of the United States of America by, well, forces, foreign and domestic. Oh my gosh, but all kidding aside once again, thank you for your generosity. 
If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so simply by going to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime and get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms like that one, you know, and uh, when I can. And the show notes and links, uh, once again, all kidding aside, the show notes and links are an integral part of of this whole uh, salon that we do here because that's really where the real reportage is. (laughs) Everything else is commentary oh it's a lot more than that isn't it this first offering here in the bistro cafe of west coast cookbook and speakeasy is by candace Choi out of the associated press food companies are coming under renewed pressure to use less salt after u.s regulators spelled out long-awaited guidelines aimed at reducing sodium levels in dozens of foods, including condiments, cereals, french fries, and potato chips. Don't eat those. Now, condiments, that's a completely different thing. Though, we can always make those condiments ourselves, don't you know? The voluntary goals were finalized yesterday, Wednesday, for 163 food categories are intended to help lower the amount of salt people eat. A majority of the sodium in U.S. diets comes from packaged or restaurant foods, not the salt added to meals at home, making it hard for people to make changes on their own. As I explained earlier, to get people to, to get people used to eating less salt, the FDA said reductions had to be gradual and across the entire food supply so people don't keep reaching for higher sodium options. By putting out the targets, it really helps to level the playing field across the industry, said Susan Maine, director of the FDA's Food Safety and Nutrition Division. Over the next two and a half years, the FDA's target sodium levels aim to cut average intake by 12%, from 3,400 to 3,000 milligrams a day. That would still leave average intake above the federally recommended limit of 2,300 milligrams a day for people 14 and older. But the agency says it will monitor industry progress and keep issuing updated targets to bring the levels closer to the recommended limit over time. Tom Halls of Reuters brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. A U.S. judge ruled yesterday, Wednesday, that Maine can bar religious exemptions to its requirement that healthcare workers in the state get vaccinated against COVID-19 a day after a judge ordered New York to allow such exemptions to its mandate. U.S. District Judge John Levy in Bangor, Maine, said the healthcare workers who brought the case have not been prevented from staying true to their religious beliefs, although refusing the vaccine will cost them their jobs. The workers also failed to show Maine officials were motivated by an improper animus toward religion or that the state lacked a compelling reason to impose the vaccine requirement, said Levy, who was nominated by former President Barack Obama. That's why he's rational. All Maine health care workers have the legal right to request reasonable accommodation for their sincerely held religious beliefs. And forcing COVID shots without exemptions is unlawful, 
said Matt Staver of Liberty Council, a Christian legal advocacy group that represented the workers. The group filed an appeal with the First U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston and requested the ruling be put on hold during the appeal process. Now, COVID-19 vaccines, as if we don't know, have become highly politicized in the U.S., where only 66% of Americans are vaccinated, well short of the initial goals of the Biden administration. And I think that's what the problem was. If Joe had never mentioned the goals, they wouldn't know. Or, I don't know. All this is to sabotage the Democratic president of the United States of America. Maine Governor Janet Mills announced her state's mandate on August 12th, and workers have until the 29th of October to comply. Exemptions were allowed for medical reasons, unlike most states. Maine does not allow for religious or philosophical exemptions to vaccine requirements. Well, I like Maine, eh? The plane w- or the plan was challenged by a group of healthcare workers who said they opposed COVID-19 vaccines because some vaccines were developed from cell lines of aborted fetuses. The workers also sued several healthcare companies where they work. Maine removed religious exemptions from mandated vaccines in 2019, and voters overwhelmingly rejected a referendum challenging the law last year. As a result, the COVID the COVID nineteen vaccine mandate is consistent with state law and does not single out religion. The judge said, by cons- by comparison, he said New York's mandate originally allowed religious exemptions and then removed them as the deadline neared. New York also allows religious exemptions to other mandated shots. Levy said. At least 24 states have imposed vaccine requirements on workers, usually in health care. Cross brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Seven major offshore wind farms would be developed on the east and west coasts and in the Gulf of Mexico under a plan announced by the Biden administration. The projects are part of President Joe Biden's plan to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030, generating enough electricity to power more than 10 million homes. Interior Secretary Deb Haaland said her department hopes to hold lease sales by 2025 off the coast of Maine, New York and the Mid-Atlantic, as well, well as the Carolinas, California, Oregon, and the Gulf of Mexico. The projects are part of Biden's plan to address global warming and could avoid about 78 million metric tons of planet warming carbon dioxide emissions while creating up to 77,000 jobs. The Interior Department is laying out an ambitious roadmap, and as we advance the administration's plans to confront climate change, create good-paying jobs, and accelerate the nation's transition to a cleaner energy future, Helen said. We have to achieve big goals to achieve a clean energy, economy, and interior is meeting the moment. In addition to offshore wind, the Interior Department is working with other federal agencies to increase renewable energy production on public lands, Alan said, with a goal of at least 25 gigawatts of onshore renewable energy from wind and solar by 2025. 
Well, why don't we get to our break? And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Emily Schwing. How do you fight an uphill battle when the problem is moving downhill? That's exactly what Denali National Park's resident geologist, Denny Capps, is trying to figure out. In recent years, the Pretty Rocks landslide transformed from a a minor maintenance concern to really our our foremost challenge. On a crisp fall day in September, just inside the park entrance, not much is happening inside the offices. Staff here are a week out from buttoning up the park for winter. But more than 40 miles down the park's only road at a place known as Pretty Rocks, things are really moving downhill at up to half an inch an hour. The Pretty Rocks landslide um, acts much more like a glacier than it does what most people consider to be a landslide. Paul Oleg is the Director of Interpretation and Education at Denali. In that it is this very ice-rich material that responds to fluctuations in temperature and will speed up and slow down based on a lot of different factors uh, regarding the, the level of the ice, the temperature of the ice, And so we tend to consider the Pretty Rocks landslide to be more like a rock glacier than what we would typically consider to be a landslide. Oleg says the landslide is a harbinger of what else may come for the entire U.S. national park system. This is, in my perspective, kind of a canary in the coal mine type of situation where You know, we're on the front lines of these climate change impacts. But as uh, we see more and more of these, more parks are going to be faced with other challenges that may be just as or even more difficult to figure out. Here in the heart of Alaska, much of the ground is supposed to be semi-permanently frozen for most of the year. But Denny Capps says the signs of a changing climate here have been evident for years. Denali is a really great place to understand what that future looks like. And also with the temperatures that we've had over the last few years, we're, we're already hitting the predictions for 2040 for here and places in the park. So we're well ahead of the existing forecast for climate change here in the park. So that's really gotten our attention. At Pretty Rocks, the road conditions were changing so much by the end of this summer season that park officials finally had to close it. Cutting off access to a visitor center that offers direct views of North America's tallest mountain and a wilderness lodge. And Pretty Rocks isn't the only spot that's keeping Denny Caps busy. Yeah, certainly not. It's all up and down the park road. We're having challenges with with permafrost. We do have a a system that we uh, refer to as the Unstable Slope Management Program, where we're tracking over 140 unstable slopes all up and down the park road. Now, not all of those are necessarily uh, being conditioned by permafrost, but many of them are. When you say 140, it seems like quite a high number of places for the, the park to have eyes on. It is a relatively high number, but we want to uh, make sure and not always be in a, in a reactive position. And some of those sites are very minor maintenance concerns, you know, things that we've maybe had to do a little bit of dirt work on in the past. And we're just watching all the way up to Pretty Rocks where we've got like major mass turnover that is causing uh, road closures. So a whole, a whole range of uh, severity and kind of magnitude and frequency of, of impacts across the board there. So what's causing all this movement? Warmer year-round temperatures combined with increased summer rainfall. It all adds up to melting what was once frozen ground. I know that I've seen more intense rainfalls and flooding. We've had a number of, of rainfall records that have been set in those 10 years that I've been here, including some very intense rainfalls 
we had what a long-term Alaska meteorologist described as the, the highest daily rainfall amount for a non-coastal site in recorded history here last year. Here on the north side of the mountains where it's relatively dry and we have a lot of topographic relief, we have thawing permafrost, having a, a rain of that, that level could, could be catastrophic for us. It's kind of like pouring hot water on an ice cube. It really is, and that's one of the things we've come to recognize is really important is this rain and specifically the temperature of that rain. Because I think we all know that if you have warm air, that can certainly warm things up. But if you have warm water, it actually carries more heat with it, and it brings that heat down into the ground. So we're really coming to recognize the importance of uh, the amount and the temperature of rainfall uh, coming down on these sensitive areas. Because much of Denali National Park is designated wilderness, long-term solutions are limited. Unfortunately, we don't want to experiment too much here. You know, this is a sensitive place. Uh, So, for example, in other locations, you might, instead of filling a a site in with gravel to build up the road, you might put in styrofoam underneath because that insulates the ground and it's much lighter. However, we don't want styrofoam coming out into our environment here (laughs) and uh, raining plastic down our rivers forever. So, you know, we are in the process of determining exactly what it is that we're going to do at these locations. But in general, at Pretty Rocks, we're probably going to end up bridging the landslide there. It's one of the classic ways that you deal with any type of geologic hazard like this. If you have a bull charging at you, you uh, step aside and and let it go by. You don't square your shoulders and and try to stop it. And so that's essentially what we're going to uh, try to do at Pretty Rocks. Denali is America's third largest national park. The two that surpass it in size are also located in Alaska, Gates of the Arctic and the Wrangell St. Elias. And there, too, large swaths of permafrost are at risk of melting. From Paul Oleg's perspective, with a focus on educating and informing the public, he says there might be a silver lining. Having specific infrastructure like a potential bridge over a landslide like Pretty Rocks uh, is a great tool for us to use. As challenging as it is, um, it does give us a very tangible item in which to frame the conversation about climate change impacts and to talk about solutions, talk about what is going to be required of parks in order to adapt to changing conditions. Park officials are working on plans for a $55 million bridge over the slumping section of road at Pretty Rocks. Construction could begin as early as next summer. Now that fall has set in and the park has received its first snowfall, there's not much left to be done other than watch and wait. We're really curious to see how it's going to respond uh, through the winter time. So last spring when we got out uh, with spring road opening in late March to, to get the road open for the season, we had about an 18 vertical foot scarp that dropped down. So we already have an, an 18 foot vertical scarp uh, at that location. So we're certainly expecting uh, major challenges uh, next spring. As is normally the case in Alaska, it's never quite clear what melting snow might reveal when warmer weather returns next year. For 60 Second Science, I'm Emily Schwing. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets and you. You are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our Secure Donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1976. 
That was the day more than one million Canadian workers walked off the job in a day of protest. The Canadian Labour Congress called the general strike. Workers downed their tools against a three-year wage control plan implemented by then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Trudeau had actually campaigned against wage controls during the 1974 election. A year later, the Liberal government introduced the C-73 anti-inflation bill. It was considered the worst attack on labor since the 1930s when bargaining rights were first legalized. Trudeau's wage controls suspended collective bargaining rights for all workers and amounted to deep wage cuts. Public sector workers were hit the hardest as many hospitals, schools, and municipal workers teetered on the edge of desperation from already low wages made worse. But for a day at least, many industries across Canada came to a screeching halt forestry, mining, and auto production all completely shut down. Many towns and cities were 100% on strike, even among the non-union workforce. St. John in New Brunswick, Sudbury, Ontario, Septille, Quebec, and Thompson in Manitoba were all cities where the strike was most successful. But elsewhere, the strike was uneven. Many public sector workers stayed on the job, while in cities like Vancouver, pickets successfully shut down bus service and newspaper deliveries. Most heralded the day of protest as a fierce show of power against a year's worth of wage controls. But others argued that one day of action was not enough. To combat the attacks on labor, any general strike would have to keep the country shut down until the program of wage controls was finally defeated. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 42 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high in the mid-60s with partly cloudy skies throughout the, throughout the day, winds light and variable, mainly clear overnight with lows in the upper 30s, winds light and variable, sunny skies tomorrow, winds light and variable with temperatures in the low 70s. Oh, indeed. Ragweed pollen is rated low right outside the window in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is 24 parts per million and the daytime UV index is moderate at 3. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.3 inches. Visibility is up to 9 miles and relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 64 and partly cloudy. Paris is 61 and sunny. Rome is 68 and sunny. Kiev is 50 degrees and fair. Kabul is 60 and clear. Hong Kong is 78 and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 66 and fair. Sydney, Australia is 62 degrees and fair. San Francisco, California is 51 degrees and fair. And New York, New York is 70 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Chang of the 
the Associated Press, brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The World Health Organization said Wednesday that officials have begun vaccinating people in the eastern Congo against Ebola. After it was confirmed last week that the disease killed a toddler, the U.N. Health Agency said in a statement that people at high risk of catching the disease, including the young boy's family members and healthcare workers, would receive first doses of the vaccine made by Merck who said about a thousand doses of the vaccine arrived in Goma, the capital of Congo's north Kivu province, and 200 doses were sent to Beni a city near the area where the first case was identified last week. The new Ebola outbreak that that started on October 8th comes after a devastating epidemic that began in 2018, when the disease killed more than 2,200 people in the conflict-ridden region, and when more than 80 Ebola responders working under WHO were found to have sexually abused children during the agency's effort to stop the disease. An Associated Press investigation in May found senior WHO management was informed of multiple instances of sexual abuse but failed to act. The people accused included a doctor who offered women jobs on the vaccination team in exchange for sex. The panel found more than 80 officials working on whose Ebola response sexually abused people in the Congo and described fundamental structural and cultural problems in the agency. Well, that's not a way to stop an epidemic. Je te donne, c'est mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Jan M. Olson of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Participants at a Holocaust Remembrance Conference in Sweden blame social media for contributing to a global rise in anti-Semitism, while YouTube and Facebook officials pledged to be part of the solution. Government and social media representatives attending the International Forum on Holocaust Remembrance in Malmo vowed to crack down on hate speech, disinformation, and the denial of facts both online and off. Facebook Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg said the company is now removing 15 times more hate speech than we were five years ago, and we're not going to stop. Really? Let's hope so. The head of the EU's executive arm, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, called Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism a threat to Jewish people, but it is also a poison for our democracies, our values, and our open societies. From Brussels, von der Leyen said the 27-nation EU plans to create a network of young European ambassadors for Holocaust remembrance, she added, who is in a better position to teach the lessons of the Shoah to their peers than our young. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was allocating one million to counter online anti-Semitic hate speech in the Middle East and North Africa. Washington also has started an expanded series of international visitor leadership programs to confront Holocaust distortion and anti-Semitism in North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Latin America, he said. Pedro Pena Head or Pina, head of YouTube in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, said the video sharing platform owned by Google pledged more than $5.8 million. 
Swedish Prime Minister Stefan Löfven, the event's host, said other pledges included new memorial sites, museums, and educational programs dedicated to preserving the history of the Holocaust and the mass killings of Roma. He said the one-day conference was, by no means, the end of the road. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know that Roots Radio broadcasts on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, and don't we deserve it? So do stay tuned to Net Roots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR. Des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver